Hello to our friends joining us via recording. We are wrapping up lesson number, um, number 11 today in our class. So when we started our lesson today, we started by looking at what Dr. Aulis's morning routine could be like um, with several different things that I would do in a typical day. So we're going to try to use the information that we covered in class yesterday about what the different lobes of the brain do and some of those specific areas in the brain to help us do each of these different things that could be part of my morning routine. So let's start here at the beginning. We're going to assume that Dr. Aulis woke up to the sun rising. That's what we're going to pretend happens because Dr. Aulis has little kids. That's never what happens, but let's pretend. When we talk about the sun rising, there's two things that, that happen, two ways that your brain works when we talk about the sun rising. There's one part of your brain that sees the light of the sun or what you'll probably see it, it phrased as on the homework or on the exam is detecting the sensation. And then we also have a part of the brain that's gonna help us to recognize or to interpret that sensation to figure out what it means. When we talk about the part of your brain that detects a stimulus, or it's the part that first receives that information, what would be the part of your brain that first receives light information? What's the name of the specific part that would first receive light information? Okay, yep, so, so big picture, we know this is something that the occipital lobe is doing, absolutely, the occipital lobe. Inside the occipital lobe, we are, are doing the process of vision. Seeing is technically called vision. So when we are first seeing something, yeah, when we first see something, that's the job of what's called the primary visual area or the primary visual cortex, for example. Uh, so both of those are, are the same thing. The, the big idea here, the first, when I first see a bright light or when I first detect a bright light, I don't know what it is, but I see it. That's the job of the primary visual area. Seeing something, not knowing what it is, the primary visual area. And like you told me, we do vision in the occipital lobe in the back part of the brain. I see this bright light and I figure out that it's the sun rising. The sun has woken me up. I'm still doing something with vision. I'm still doing something with seeing, but now I'm recognizing or I'm using my memories to help me figure out what it is I'm looking at. Instead of that being a job of the primary visual area, what do I call the part of your brain that helps you figure out what you're looking at? Yeah, when I'm, when I'm figuring out what it is that I'm looking at, what it is that I'm smelling or tasting or all that kind of stuff, all, whenever you're figuring something out or recognizing something, that's the job of an association area. So association means we're, we're understanding, we're figuring out what it is that we're looking at, what it, what it means. Yeah, and, and Jacqueline's totally right there. That's something that the occipital lobe would do. So both of these, these functions here, detecting the sunlight or first seeing that sunlight, that's the primary visual area. Figuring out that it's the sun and not a really bright light that just got turned on, that's the visual association area. Okay, Dr. Aulis has woken up. We have woken up to sunlight. Now I've made the very important decision that I make every single day without a fail that I need to make coffee. When I make a decision, when I plan something, when I decide to do something, which of those lobes of my brain would, would help me to decide things? Or put another way, be the part of my brain that has my personality. That's the way we talked about it yesterday. Yeah, Jesse's right. 
the part of your brain that helps you to make decisions is the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe. And it, it was a little tricky for us because I only mentioned this really briefly yesterday. And again, I promise I'm not going to test you on this specific part of the frontal lobe. But remember that there's an area called the prefrontal cortex. And that's the area where a lot of your personality comes from, a lot of your, your reasoning skills. So when you're making a decision that you need to have coffee, which again, that's an everyday decision for me, that decision is made in a part of the frontal lobe called the prefrontal cortex. I have decided that, that I need to make coffee. My frontal lobe helps me make decisions. Yeah, so there's a good correlation for us. Um, we, we talked about yesterday how the, the cortex is the name of the gray matter on the outside of the brain. Yeah, so the prefrontal cortex is found on the outside of the frontal lobe in the very front of the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, great correlation. The, the cortex area of the brain, by the way, that had a lot or a little myelin. When we talk about the cortex, the outside of the brain. Yeah, the outside of the brain had just a little bit of myelin because uh, it, it, it's, that's why it's gray, right? Because it has very little myelin in it. So great correlation there. That word cortex, that's the gray matter on the outside specifically in the frontal lobe. Hey, by the way, in general, I think I asked both my groups this. When we talk about the frontal lobe, does the frontal lobe do sensory stuff or motor stuff? What kind of stuff does that frontal lobe do? Yeah, so the frontal lobe primarily is going to do motor type stuff. Motor type stuff, here we'll get a step ahead of ourselves here. Motor type stuff like pouring a cup of coffee, that movement, that um, directions that you're gonna send to your arms and to your fingers and all of that, that's going to originate from the frontal lobe. Now we did specifically talk yesterday about a structure in the frontal lobe that controls the contraction of your skeletal muscles. Which part of the frontal lobe has a map of your whole body that helps you to, to move different parts of your body? I'm gonna be mean and, and make you spell it. You can totally butcher it, that's okay. Yeah, so, so the easier way to, to refer to it, right, the lab way to refer to it was that thing called the precentral gyrus. But Nicole's totally right. The, the structure that is in the precentral gyrus that we, we use to tell us exactly which part of the body we're moving is called the motor homunculus, the motor homunculus. So the motor homunculus, the motor map, is is inside or it's covering the precentral gyrus. Uh, so Jacqueline asked the question, why our decision to make coffee is not also the precentral gyrus? Um, yes, your reasoning is correct, Jacqueline. This decision here, when I've decided that I want to make a cup of coffee, I, I could add a step, and I probably should have added a step right here in the middle where like you measure your coffee grounds and pour your water and all that kind of stuff. Just making a decision doesn't involve moving any muscles. Anything that involves moving those skeletal muscles, like pouring the coffee, like measuring the coffee grounds, all that kind of stuff would be the motor homunculus. So the motor homunculus only specifically controls movements. Technically, the movements you decide to do actually start in other places of the frontal lobe. And then we send them to the motor homunculus so that they can connect with the neurons that go down to your fingers or that go down to your legs. So yes, the short answer, after all those, those long things to say, there's not movement here yet. Therefore, it wouldn't be the motor homunculus yet. We've talked about what our frontal lobe does 
from making decisions, giving you your personality, helping you with movements. When we talk about the process of hearing, because that's what's going on right here, which lobe of the brain helps us with hearing? When we're talking about a sound, which lobe does hearing? Yeah, the, the temporal lobe is the lobe that does hearing. It's the lobe that's right by the ear, right? Notice the wording of this question. The wording of this question mentions recognizing. Or here, let me give you another word that you might see on, on the homework or you might see it on the exam. This other word is processing. When we talk about recognizing something, when we talk about processing something, is that the job of a primary area or an association area? When we're processing or recognizing. Yeah, when we, when we talk about those kinds of keywords there, we're definitely talking about an association area. And because we're talking about sounds, in particular the sound of the coffee pot finishing brewing, that's the auditory association area, the auditory association area, because it sounds. If instead of saying we are recognizing the sound of, of the coffee pot finishing, if we detected the sound of the coffee pot, the sounds the coffee pot's making, that would be our primary auditory area. But because we're figuring out what they mean, that's the job of the association area. Hey, yesterday we briefly talked about the other function of the temporal lobe. And it was kind of funky. The temporal lobe does hearing. Yeah, and the temporal lobe also does smell, the special sense of smell. So when we're over here, uh, when we talk about smelling your coffee, the sense of smell is something that the temporal lobe also does. Since we don't have any terminology in, in this particular activity, to say that we're smelling that this is Starbucks coffee today versus Aldi coffee today uh, versus caramel coffee, for example, we're just straight up smelling it. We're not interpreting it yet. If I'm just straight up smelling something or just detecting something, which kind of area helps us with just detecting something? What's the word that I would use for that? Yeah, where we've got another primary area. The process of smell, the technical name for it is olfaction. Remember that olfactory nerve? The olfactory nerve was the one that helped with smell. So the primary olfactory area is the area that just smells the coffee. Yeah, so Nicole posed a great example. When I smell it and I recognize that it's not cake, or it's not those donuts that we were talking about, right, at the beginning of class today, when I interpret the fact that what I am smelling is coffee and not something else, absolutely, that would be the job of, of the association area. So just smelling what the coffee's, just, just smelling something, detecting, here I'll give us a, a, a unit number four word, uh, detecting, they're called odorants. Odorants, that's the things you smell. When we talk about smelling our coffee, we're, we're talking about detecting those odorants. So what, what we're smelling, figuring out that those odorants are coffee and not cake and not donuts and not milk. That would be the job of the association area. Let's jump down here to another one that I put a little asterisk on, a little tricky one here. When we talk about the process of tasting, who can remember from lab which lobe of the brain does taste? Which lobe of the brain did taste? Taste, by the way, called gustation. There's our, our technical name. Yeah, and, and Nicole is right. It's that lobe of the brain called the insula. The insula. We can or cannot see the insula. 
when we look at the brain. We can or cannot see that lobe. Yeah, we, we can't see the insula. The insula is the one that's on the very inside of the brain. So we didn't label it yesterday because it's on the very inside of the brain. So the insula is, is where I do taste. When we talk about tasting our coffee, if we're using um, just the straight up, we are detecting taste dents. That's what, what the flavors are that you detect, the taste dents. If we're just detecting those taste dents, that's going to be the primary gustatory area. If we talk about, um, when we say tasting your coffee, um, realizing the coffee is weak, that's like the worst thing in the world, right? Realizing you brewed your coffee weak, that's going to be the job of the gustatory association area. When I am tasting it and interpreting, oh, this is not as strong as usual. Interpretation, um, memories, that kind of stuff, that's the association area. Detecting, um, seeing something for the first time, hearing something without processing at all, that's going to be the job of those primary areas. The last thing on our list here talks about the temperature of your coffee. When we were talking yesterday about temperature, did we say that temperature was a special sense or a general sense? Temperature. Yeah, so um, we're, we're checking in the chat. Temperature is considered a general sense. So when we talk about a general sense, all of our general sensory information was actually sent to the same place in the brain. Where did all of that general sensory information go? Yep, so it's all going somewhere in the parietal lobe, parietal lobe. Where do we have that map? Yeah, there's that, that map word, right? The sensory homunculus, the sensory homunculus, which is found in that post-central gyrus. Absolutely, found in the post-central gyrus. If we change this from temperature to, let's see, what else could we change it to? Um, texture, for example, if, if you brewed it and some of those grounds got into your coffee, if we were detecting the texture, um, if it was so crazy hot that it burned you, that would be another thing that we would detect here in the post-central gyrus. But when we talk about tasting, when we talk about smelling, those all have their own places in the brain. But all of that general sensory information about your coffee would be going to that, that sensory homunculus on the post-central gyrus. Before we briefly label these on our picture, do we have any questions about it before we move to their locations? Or send me an emoji. What are we thinking? Here's my relevant emoji. Yep, it, it is, Jacqueline. It's a lot of a lot of info we're working on applying to. That always makes it harder, right? When we're not applying what we learn. So the goal of this activity is to really help us see the difference between primary areas versus association areas and how those sensory homunculus and motor homunculus are, are different from each other. Yeah, Christina's still a little skeptical. That's okay. Let's briefly label here. So we've got all those things that we, we said on the previous slide that we use in the morning. So the process of seeing a bright light and recognizing that light, 
both of those happen in the same lobe of the brain lobe does all of your vision stuff happen in where in the brain is that vision stuff yep it's in the occipital lobe remember that's in the very back oh yeah i, I thought i was going to be brave and, and draw my numbers that's going to be a no-go let's start over with typing <laughs> all right so step number one and step number two both of those in the occipital lobes first i send the light to the primary visual area then i process it in the visual association area both of them in the occipital lobe when i talk about deciding to make my coffee we said that that was the job of the frontal lobe the prefrontal cortex in particular so will that here toward the very front of the brain number three making that decision we brew that coffee that coffee finishes brewing so we're now looking for the location of the auditory association area which lobe had that auditory association area or auditory in general yeah that's the the temporal lobe when we talk about moving pouring our coffee moving our muscles remember that we said that our movements come from the motor homunculus that's in the precentral gyrus the precentral gyrus is the bump right here right in front of the central sulcus so pouring that cup of coffee the directions come from the precentral gyrus I'll mention that the detecting the temperature we said happened in the post central gyrus so it's right behind this bump that i have right along here that's where i would detect that temperature of the coffee remember that smell also happened here in the temporal lobe so let's add a six for smell and the process of taste i know one of my kind of did this thing here put a circle there in the very middle that's perfect the process of taste happens in the insula that's the deep lobe of the brain all the way in the very middle all right let me check out my questions here okay so uh jacqueline has a question about sensory functions in general um, when we talk about the parietal lobe and you're you're memorizing its big picture function Here's the emphasis I want you to, to put on its big picture function. It does general senses. From lab, we said that this is a lobe that does sensory information. I want you to remember and memorize and put a big star in your mind that the kind of sensory information that goes to the parietal lobe is general sensory information. Temperature, touch, pain, stretching, that kind of stuff when we talk about special sensory information like taste like smell like vision all of that kind of stuff is in my other lobe of the brain so uh, a good clarifier for us here the only kind of sensory information in the parietal lobe is general sensory information um, and then Nicole asked the question, is the prefrontal cortex anterior or superficial? Um, honestly, I'm not 100% familiar with its location. I would suspect it's a little bit of both. Um, anterior, so I know it's definitely toward the front part of the frontal lobe. Um, when we talk about doing functions in, in the brain, remember that the gray matter is always found superficial. And we need gray matter to do all the, the processing that goes into your personality and your decision making. So I would suspect that the prefrontal cortex is both anterior toward the front side of the, the frontal lobe and on the outside in the superficial area. All right, I know this is a lot to take in. I do not suspect that we feel awesome about it just yet. We still have some time to, to work on feeling better about it. 
So rest assured, it's totally fine if you don't don't love all of this just yet. Um, remember, I mentioned this yesterday, but I'll mention it again. Remember that the brain homework assignment, I have extended that due date to Sunday to give you a little bit more time to mull around with the material to process it. Um, I would recommend trying to wrap it up closer to Friday, tomorrow, the original due date, just to give you time to work on the other unit number three assignments. But you do have some extra time just to make sure that, that you're able to practice this kind of stuff. So big picture goal of this activity, know the difference between a primary area and a secondary area. And know the difference between general senses and special senses. Those are our two biggest picture ideas from this activity. How do we feel about those, those two kinds of areas? Oh, did I say secondary? I meant association. I apologize. <laughs> it's that coffee not kicking in yet. So primary versus association areas, yes. Absolutely. Primary versus association and general senses versus special senses. Yeah, I, I can understand that about to be so lost if I was totally changing the words on you. I'm not this time. Anatomy likes to change the words on you, right? But that is not an example of, of changing the words on you. <laughs> I went into protein mode. Let's just be real. Primary structure, secondary structure. Tertiary structure, we get to bring those back for the final. So I'll get my secondary back in, back in the day. <laughs> okay, so yesterday when we wrapped up, when we, we ran out of time, essentially, uh, we landed on this particular slide. We didn't really talk about it, uh, but, but this is where we ended up. When we are looking at, at our slide here, we are looking at two different kinds of disorders that we can see that affect a particular part of the brain. Can you help me out in the chat? Uh, which part of the brain do things like Tourette's syndrome, that's what I see over here, and Parkinson's disease, part of the brain are affected in these diseases yeah um, so I'm seeing it seeing it in my chat here type it in onto the slide the the part of the brain that is affected um, in Tourette's syndrome and in Parkinson's disease are called the basal nuclei and um, Vanessa's totally right here when we talk about basal nuclei what we need to remember about these two important things. First important thing is that basal nuclei are made of gray matter. Ooh, I spelled that wrong. <laughs> They're made of gray matter, apparently. Uh, made of gray matter. We said this already in class today. Gray matter has a lot or a little myelin. A lot or a little myelin. Yeah, just going to have a little bit of myelin. It's going to have more of those, if you recall from our discussion, um, more cell bodies, more dendrites, more of the thinking parts of a neuron. So the first thing for us to know about basal nuclei is that they have those thinking parts. They're made of gray matter. But unlike most of the gray matter in the brain, the basal nuclei are found in the middle of the brain. So found in the middle of the brain. So to, to use our technical terminology, they're found deep in the brain, the basal nuclei. The job of the basal nuclei is to prevent unwanted movements, to prevent unwanted movements the best way to see what a base what the basal nuclei do is to look at these diseases when the basal nuclei are not working so in an individual with parkinson's disease the biggest way that you identify parkinson's disease are things called tremors 
So tremors are repeated movements, um, as you can kind of see in the picture, kind of shaking back and forth, whether it's the hands, whether it's the entire head, whether it's the feet. Um, tremors are an example of messages continually being sent to these various parts of the body without the basal nuclei stopping them, without the basal nuclei saying, actually, we don't need to move our head back and forth. Actually, we don't need to shake our hands back and forth. If I don't stop those unwanted movements, I can have what's called a tremor. Tremors occur for a long period of time. Another example, though, of what can happen when the basal nuclei aren't working are things called ticks. Ticks are a lot more um, short-lived, if you will. So in our image here, we're looking at a little boy who's, who's doing art with uh, some classmates, and this facial expression flashes across his face. Or he might have a different facial expression in the next second that flashes across his face. Ticks are much more short-lived. Um, they're kind of random outbursts, if you will. There can be vocal ticks, which can be noises or can be random words. There can be, like we're seeing here, a motor tick where there's a movement that happens um, very briefly out of, out of the blue. The big idea with our ticks as well, though, is that we normally wouldn't have done these movements, but the basal nuclei are not stopping those random directions from being sent. So basal nuclei stop you from doing things that you don't want to. When we talked yesterday about the prefrontal cortex, about that motor homunculus, that's where all of our, our directions or our decisions to do a particular movement, that's where they all start from, the motor cortex. When we talked about the cerebellum, that was the last, the last structure we said with movements. What did we say the job of the cerebellum was related to movements? How does the cerebellum relate to movements? Yeah, so it, it does a couple of things. Remember that the cerebellum helps to keep you balanced or it does your equilibrium so we don't fall down when we're moving. But the other thing that the cerebellum does is it helps to smooth out those movements. Remember we were talking about how alcohol affects the cerebellum. So it, it you look drunk basically when your cerebellum's not working correctly. Uh, it, its job, we talked about how it, it gets the, the extra copy of the directions of, of what movement your body is trying to do. And it compares that to what it feels like your body's actually doing. And if you're doing something wrong, the cerebellum helps to fix it. So here's my, my wink, wink, nudge, nudge for you. As you are studying movement in the body, make sure that we are reviewing the job of those three structures or those three parts of the brain in the process of movement. So we talked about the precentral gyrus. We talked about the cerebellum, and we talked about the basal nuclei. Make sure when you think about the process of movement, you can describe the job of these three things in movement. I'm fairly certain there's a homework question that, that makes you make those correlations, but make sure we know what each of them do in the process of movement. Yeah, Jacqueline, they, they kind of all relate to each other, not directly per se. Um, so remember what we said is that the precentral gyrus is who gives the orders about what we're doing. The cerebellum checks how well we're doing at following those orders. And the basal nuclei basically makes sense or, or makes sure that we're not doing anything besides the orders that came from here. So all three of these parts of your brain need to be working correctly for you to do movement correctly. That's kind of the big picture for us. Let's switch gears from movement into the limbic system. The limbic system gets fun pictures. Um, when we talk about the limbic system, 
for for my friends who've had a chance to work on this this lesson outline what did how did i describe the function of the limbic system as a whole what's what's the limbic system all about in general exactly yep so when we think about the limbic system sometimes the limbic system is called your emotional brain your emotional brain so there are a lot of different parts of of your brain that work together to help you have emotions um, but there's a few parts in particular that we're going to to focus on by the way i think that there's at least a few of us in the audience that would recognize this particular picture where did this picture come from who knows please tell me at least one of us knows <laughs> there we go yep christina <laughs> people with kids might know might know this um, this is from a movie called inside out um, if you have not seen that movie i recommend in all your spare time right because you're not doing anything these days um, i would recommend taking a peek at this movie because it talks about um, or it kind of shows what what theoretically could happen in your brain um, with all your different emotions. So my daughter actually has inside out figurines. These are her two favorite, joy and sadness. Um, and it's really funny because when she can't find joy, she, she says that sadness is going because she can't find joy, which is just so perfect. Um, but you've got joy, sadness, disgust, fear, and anger. Um, kind of the raw basic emotions. And the, the whole movie is centered on what happens if our emotions go haywire and we we can't um, function normally. Uh, so it's a very cute, fun movie. I think it's reasonably anatomically accurate and told. I'm not a neuroscientist, but um, I know for the record that you have no spare time right now. But maybe over Thanksgiving, if you decide to take a little break, um, inside out, inside out, I'll type its name down here would be a movie that, that I would recommend. It's a fun one. When we're looking at, at this picture here, we'll start here since we were talking about it. This is a point in the movie where joy and sadness are, are inside the girl's part of her brain called long-term memory. Um, they're trying to get back to headquarters, the part of her brain where she's um, in control of things. So they're stuck here in memory. What uh, this part of the brain is representing in the limbic system is something called the hippocampus. The hippocampus. When you're thinking about your limbic system or your emotional brain, what you should know about the hippocampus is that this is your memory center. Couple of fun facts about the hippocampus. Actually, one kind of big picture, cool fact about the hippocampus. This is the one part of the brain where your brain always does mitosis. This is the one part of the brain where we can keep doing mitosis. What happens in mitosis? What's going on in mitosis? Do we remember? Yeah, so mitosis was the process that our cells used to divide to make new cells to, to duplicate themselves absolutely your hippocampus which is your memory center in your brain the neurons are constantly dividing we're always making new neurons what that means like christina mentioned in the chat is that we can always make new memories we're constantly making new neurons so we can constantly make new brains. So hippocampus is the memory center of your brain, always growing and dividing, always giving you the ability to make new memories. What helps us to make memories is when we um, have some particular kinds of stimuli. So one of the kinds of, of stimuli, or one of the emotions, if you will, that helps us to make memories is when we're afraid. Uh, or when we're angry, when we have strong emotions, it's easier for us to make memories in our hippocampus. The part of your brain that's important for um, fear or important for rage, as they call it, is something called the amygdaloid body or 
what you've probably heard it called is the amygdala. They're exactly the same thing. So the amygdaloid body and then the amygdala, same thing. This is the part of your brain that we would call um, responsible for, like I said, the fear responses, or like we're seeing here on, on this particular cat, this is what they call the rage response in a cat. Um, so here's experiments we can't do in humans <laughs> because it's completely unethical, is um, scientists had some cats and in some of the cats, they stimulated the amygdaloid body or they stimulated the amygdala. So they, they made the, the cats activated, if you will. So if any of you have a cat, you know what the rage response looks like, right? So they're like hissing and spitting, they're swatting at you. Um, so when the amygdaloid body is activated, you get this rage response like we see in the cat. But then they also had some other cats that they removed the amygdaloid body from. And when they removed the amygdaloid body, the cats had zero fear. You know that phrase that um, curiosity killed the cat? <laughs> so if you take away the fear in response in cats, um, they become dogs, basically. Not quite. <laughs> but they, they stop being afraid of anything. No more scaredy cat. Um, this experiment, and, and yes, I see our, our chatter, right, that it's it's not not nice to do these things in cats either. Um, what, what they found in this experiment correlated really well to what they see in humans who have damaged amygdalas. Uh, in humans with damaged amygdalas, they have no fear response either. So they're, they're fearless people, which is all well and good, except in situations where fear helps to keep you safe. So an example of this would be if someone with a damaged amygdala was in a bank and a bank robber came inside, that wouldn't make them feel afraid. And those they, they would look around at the people around them whose faces would be showing fear and they wouldn't be afraid either. They, they couldn't read the fear on the faces of people around them. So not only does the amygdala um, make you have emotions, it also helps you to interpret the emotions of people around you. If they're feeling afraid, if they're feeling angry, um, if your amygdala is not working, you can't interpret those things on other people as well. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, Nicole, if it's, it's all the emotions um, or if it's more specifically like the fear emotion that you can't interpret. Um, it's at least the emotion of fear that you can't interpret in others if your amygdala is not, not functioning because you don't feel that emotion. <laughs> so amygdala, fear and anger, important not only for you experiencing it, but also um, seeing it in the faces of other people. The other thing that we're gonna mention here with your emotional brain, with the limbic system, is the, the job of the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb. Now, the olfactory bulb is just the very end of the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve number one. What was the function of the olfactory nerve? Cranial nerve number one. What was its job? Yeah, exactly. That was the sense of smell, right? Sense of smell. The other thing um, besides emotions like rage, anger, fear, that kind of stuff, helping you to make memories. The other thing that can kind of help you make memories is when you have sensations like smell sensations. So I've got a picture of cookies here um, because maybe you or your grandma or your mom or somebody in your life made really awesome cookies that every time you smell them, it takes you back. Um, or maybe we're coming up on, on Thanksgiving, right? Whatever that's gonna look like. <laughs> um, but the smell of the pumpkin pie maybe always takes you back. Um, we call that kind of an emotional response to smells. Although I feel like what we can maybe more resonate with besides just emotional responses to food is if you have uh, an ex that always wore the same perfume or the same cologne, anytime you smell that, it takes you back for better or worse to what that experience was like. Um, so we can have emotional responses to smells thanks to the olfactory bulb or thanks to our olfactory nerve 
that helps us through the process of smell. So lots of emotions make it easier for us to make memories. Strong sensations like smell sensations make it easier for us to make memories. And remember that the hippocampus is the part of the brain where we're storing memories. <laughs> so Jesse mentioned one of her emotional responses to smells. Yeah, alcohol breath. <laughs> probably, probably not a, a pleasant smell to, to be responding to, right? I, I have a couple of um, Bath and Body Works scents that I wore like way back in the day when I was an undergrad. And so I smell those and it takes me back to when I was a, a young, young, little youngling there. Or the special kind of soap that I used to wash my daughter when she was a baby. So little things like that. The hippocampus stores memories. Let's talk about memories. Um, when we talk about memories, there's two kinds of, of memories in your brain that you can make. You can make what are called short-term memories, and you can make what are called long-term memories. Now, 100%, I, um, I feel like the reason that the district has asked me to cover memories with you is to help you with uh, having better study habits. <laughs> so when you're studying the process of building memories, Keep in mind why I'm teaching you this is to help you study better. So hopefully we can, can learn some study skills to help us out with this class and, and all of our other classes. Here's the way that memory works. We start with some kind of information that we receive. Some of that information is general sensory information. So for example, the pain that would come from a tack pressing on your finger, um, that would be general information or we can receive special sensory information. That's the words you're reading on the slide. That's the sounds you're hearing from my voice. All of the stimuli around you um, is gonna go originally into kind of a temporary storage space. Your brain, we'll, we'll talk about, there's a part of your brain called the thalamus that sorts through it. Some of that information that, that comes up through your senses, your thalamus says that's not important and you just completely lose it. You never retain it at all. If your thalamus decides that it's important information that maybe we, we might wanna hold on to, that information will get sent down here to short-term memory. Now, the thing with short-term memory is that there's just a very limited amount of space in short-term memory. Short-term memory is something like seven to eight facts in it. If you think about the length of a phone number, that's not even technically enough space for a phone number to be stored in your brain. So short-term memory, not a lot of space. This, by the way, is the reason why cramming for an exam doesn't work. Because good luck, you get seven facts. <laughs> short-term memory, space for seven things. Obviously, we need to get things into long-term memory for us to be able to use them, for us to be able to store more of them. So something that, that you've heard in class, we talked about the primary visual area today. We need to get that information from short-term memory, sometimes called working memory, down to long-term memory, which is um, the, um, the, the kind of memory that's gonna stick around for a lot longer. It's gonna help us for the exam. How we get that information there? If we're really excited about it, so if that information relates to our life somehow and it makes us excited to learn this, uh, that's a great way to do it. Uh, if we can somehow relate the new information back to something else that's already in long-term memory, that's gonna help us memorize it more. But here is the, the least sexy way to get things from short-term to long-term memory and it's through rehearsing them. So by reading and writing and hearing over and over and over again that the visual association area helps me to interpret what I'm seeing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's repetition, it's rehearsal. Over and over and over again. So the, the most common way you're gonna get stuff from short-term memory to long-term memory is through the process of rehearsing it through the process of doing it again and again and again. But 
the more you can make this new stuff connect to the old stuff, the easier it's going to be, or maybe the less rehearsal it's going to take to get it to go from short term to long term. So this is why I like to point out to, to you all how repeatedly, remember how we always talk about the salty banana and we hate that stupid salty banana, but we will never forget the salty banana because the salty banana is in our, our long-term memory. When we can connect things like that, that neuron graph to the salty banana, the more we can associate old stuff with new stuff, the easier it is to remember. So long-term memory forms when we rehearse something, when we attach it to something old. Um, yeah, Gloria's asking about faking excitement. It doesn't even have to be like true excitement um, as, as much as just making sure you're like alert and awake when you're trying to study, that, that by itself can help too. So, um, just being awake and alert can help you to get information from short term down into long term. The thing about long term though is it's not forever term. And we all know this because we've taken multiple classes in college and, and in high school and middle school. And there's stuff that we knew back in the day that, that we can't do anymore, right? So, so over time, if we're not using our long-term memories, we may lose them. So they become unretrievable. We just can't do them anymore. So use it or lose it with your long-term memories. They're more likely to stick around longer Short-term memories, they're only around long enough for you to do what you need to do. I like to, to give the analogy, I, I think it's even in the lesson for you, that back in the day I was a sandwich artist, meaning I worked at Subway. Um, and my short-term memory was, what kind of bread do you want? What kind of meat do you want? What kind of cheese do you want? I would, would memorize that for a very short period of time. And as soon as I was done with that, that order, I'd forget it. My next person come in, tell me what kind of bread you want, what kind of cheese you want, what, what kind of meat you want. Okay, made your order and I forget it. So there was none of the transfer between short term and long term. My working memory was just as long as I needed it without, without me holding on to it for longer. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're thinking about techniques, right, to get us from short term memory to long term memory. Gloria is saying five shots of espresso. Uh, that would make us excited. I, I'm not sure how productively excited would be, but we would certainly be excited. <laughs> that is for certain. Okay, so um, as as you're studying, big picture, and and I agree, right? Several of us are saying we should have talked about this at the beginning. Maybe maybe we we should have. That would have been maybe more helpful. Um, by this point in the semester, we all know you just gotta rehearse it over and over again. That's gonna help you to get from short term into long term, and then you'll be able to recall that information. Here, let's hone in on that, that excitement thing. Um, I, I told you that we don't have to just be excited. We at least need to be awake. Awake is helpful to us when we're thinking about um, our ability to retain information. The part of your brain that keeps you awake and alert is called the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system, or you'll see it abbreviated in the notes, RAS. And I'm just gonna call it RAS, because that's, that's way shorter. So the reticular activating system, or RAS, is the system that your brain uses to keep you awake. So let's be real, I know that, that class is really long and you're sitting in front of a computer. And it's really tough to stay awake sometimes and to stay focused sometimes. Thankfully, we have RAS to keep us awake. What we need to know about the reticular activating system is the kinds of information that it's receiving. So the fact that you have this, this slide showing on your computer screen, you're collecting visual information. That visual information is feeding into your reticular activating system, telling you, I should stay awake. I should stay alert. The fact that the sound on your computer is on, you're collecting auditory information. That's going in and telling your reticular activating system, I need to hear this, I should stay awake. Information like touch information, so the feel of, of your mouse in your hand or your pen on your hand. Um, things like pain or temperature, if you keep your room really cold to make you stay awake. 
all of those kinds of things feed into the reticular activating system as well to, to tell it I'm supposed to stay awake. So the reticular activating system takes this kind of information and it processes it to say, right, we're, we're supposed to be awake right now. And then it sends little pings or kind of little excitatory messages out to everywhere in the cerebrum, essentially keeping the cerebrum at least half awake. Because if I send these little pings up here, the cerebrum knows that at any moment I could see something important. So my occipital lobe better not fall asleep on me. I might see something important or my parietal lobe better not fall asleep on me because I might need to adjust the way I'm, I'm holding my pen or my frontal lobe better not fall asleep on me because I might have to think about something and process something. So the reticular activating system keeps everybody awake or, or pings them just enough so that they're ready to receive actually important messages. For my friends who've worked on the lesson, what happens when you're sleeping? What does your reticular activating system do when you're sleeping? Does anyone know? Yeah, so, so when we're sleeping, the reticular activating system essentially shuts itself off or it becomes deactivated. Um, so we turn it off when, when we're trying to sleep or um, I, I like to think about too, in, in the middle of the night when my little one woke up, his reticular activating system loves to turn back on. So he just recently found the, the upper part of his vocal register. So he was singing to me at, at three in the morning yesterday. His reticular activating system was on point. He was awake. <laughs> so when you're sleeping or when you can't fall asleep, now you know the technical name of what to blame, right? Curse you, Rass. It's time for me to be sleeping. So you, when you sleep, let's, let's make a note here for ourselves. When we sleep, the reticular activating system essentially turns off. So it, it, it's not activated. When I want to turn it back on, when it's time to wake up, I can use things like visual impulses, so a bright light. I can use things like auditory impulses, that's hearing a sound from my alarm clock or from my cell phone, right? Uh, I could use something like general sensory information, so somebody touching me or pouring cold water on me if they're mean. All that kind of stuff feeds into the reticular activating system to get it reactivated to help me wake up again. When someone is in a coma, what's happening with their reticular activating system when they're in a coma? And I'll mention in a coma, you don't wake up. Yeah, so, so when you're in a coma, your reticular activating system is damaged, uh, meaning it won't turn back on. When someone's in a, in a coma, they've turned off their reticular activating system, except we can't get it to turn back on. All of the normal stimuli that would have turned it back on if we were sleeping no longer works for us. So the brain stays in this coma state where it's no longer functioning. So the reticular activating system, really the two big picture ideas for you to know with it is this is what keeps you awake and alert. And also if it's not working, if it's not doing its job, you're in a coma. You are not conscious is the word that, that we would use. So conscious is when all these parts of your brain are, are active and you're able to do stuff. When you're not conscious, the reticular activating system is not doing that job. We mentioned in, um, in the lesson, I believe, the importance of smoke detectors in saving lives. Smoke detectors save a lot of lives and the way that they save lives is because of this reticular activating system. When we look at the kinds of, of information that the reticular activating system receives that helps it to turn on, we have things like visual impulses. We have things like auditory impulses. When you think about a smoke detector, the first thing it's going to do is yell at you, right? So I had this terrible one when I lived in Tulsa, terrible in a good way, um, that it would definitely wake me up if needed. Um, 
my my smoke detector would yell fire fire and then go eh, eh, and it would just do this repeatedly i know this because i burned enough pizzas in the day right so auditory impulses are something that smoke detectors are really good at, at doing some smoke detectors especially the ones for example in a school or in a really big building also have lights that flash when when they're activated so they're they're putting out visual impulses why would we need a smoke detector to wake us up what kind of information do we not receive in the reticular activating system um, to tell us we need to get out of the house yeah vanessa's right there's there's no smell information here if you were awake and your house was on fire the first way you would know is because you would smell it when you're sleeping when your re reticular activating system is turned off you don't receive smell impulses so the smell of smoke is not going to wake you up and by the time the heat of the fire wakes you up you're probably not getting out of the house right or um, by the time the pain of of having too much smoke in your lungs would would wake you up it, it's too late for you to get out of the house that provide some of those stimuli that activate the reticular activating system to make sure that you wake up fast enough to help you get out of the house in time so reticular activating system one of the good ways to think about it is the reason that we need smoke detectors to help us wake up when we're sleeping to help us get out of the house um, yes that's correct Christina when we are sleeping we still hear auditory information we still get visual information, uh, but we don't have smell information feeding into this system here. Let's talk about the opposite of the reticular activating system. Um, how many of us are, are feeling this guy right here? This is totally me. Actually, this is me without coffee. Let's be fair. <laughs> My coffee helps me not be like this. <laughs> Okay, so so this poor friend over here is is in the end of the semester crunch and he's feeling really tired. Um, part of why he is feeling so tired could be because of the work of his pineal gland, his pineal gland. So when we talk about the pineal gland, there's something that it spits out a type of hormone that makes you really sleepy. What does the pineal gland make that makes you sleepy? Yeah, there it is. The pineal gland makes melatonin. So melatonin is a hormone that your body normally makes. Um, it's supposed to make it when it's time for you to go to sleep and it's supposed to make it all night long. And when it's about time for you to wake up, it's supposed to stop making it. Now, Sometimes we make too much melatonin. Perhaps that's what's going on with our friend here. Sometimes, though, we experience what's called jet lag. Jet lag. Not that we experience that much right now, right? There's not a lot of flying going on in the world. But the way that jet lag works is your pineal gland gets synced up with the time zone that you were in as opposed to the time zone that you're currently in. And so your pineal gland starts making melatonin at what would have been bedtime in your other time zone, except you're not in the other time zone anymore. And that messes up the when you're releasing melatonin. So jet lag caused by that pineal gland making melatonin at the wrong times. Check out my friend over here. She's getting her treatment for, for uh, jet lag over here. It's literally called bright light therapy bright light therapy literally that's its name and the way bright light therapy works is you sit next to a light a light that is as bright as the sun um, or it, it emits the same kind of wavelengths as the sun and look at how happy you'll feel when you sit next to that bright light with your coffee obviously so bright light therapy literally is is something that can be used to help with jet lag the goal of bright light therapy is to tell your pineal gland and your brain in general, hey, it, the sun is up, 
it's time for us to be awake. It's time for us to not be spitting out melatonin. So jet lag is a problem with, with melatonin levels. Too much melatonin, you feel sleepy. If we, we trick our, our pineal gland into getting back on the right time clock uh, with this bright light, that'll help us to make less melatonin, make us less sleepy. Also a reason, by the way, to uh, when you're feeling really tired, open up those curtains, open up those blinds, get some bright light in and see if that helps. At this point in the semester, it may not help, right? There just may be no saving it, but it's worth a shot. All right, so let's go now um, to the other part. Let me, let me mention, when we were talking about the pineal gland, that was part of something from lab called the epithalamus. Epithalamus. Oh, I spelled that wrong. The epithalamus was the part, if you remember from lab, that was above the thalamus. That's what epi means. The thalamus is the big part in the very middle of the brain. When we talk about the thalamus, the thalamus has nothing to do really with um, melatonin secretion. The thalamus, you might think of kind of like a filter. Um, so when you're thinking about the thalamus, the word that I want it to trigger in your mind is, is a filter or like a sorter, a thing that, that figures out what of the information you're receiving you actually care about, what information you don't care about, and um, it sends it to the right place in the brain. My favorite example of, of what the thalamus does that's less applicable right now because we're all at home in front of our computers. But um, my favorite thing to talk about the thalamus doing is the thalamus sorts out information and tells you what you don't care about. One of the things that it tells you you don't care about is the fact that hopefully right now you are wearing pants or you're wearing some kind of something. When we're in class together, I say you're wearing shoes. You aren't constantly thinking about the clothes that you're wearing, even though those clothes are constantly touching your skin, you're constantly detecting that they're there, you don't consciously perceive them. In other words, we're not processing them in our postcentral gyrus, we're not thinking about them in our, our, our frontal lobe. That's because the thalamus determined that that information isn't important. Now at the same time, um, if we feel like there's a bug crawling on our arm, for example, that information would get sent to the thalamus. The thalamus would say, hey, this is actually important. And it would send it to the right place on that map. Remember how we've got that map here, the sensory homunculus? The thalamus makes sure that that information gets to the right place on the map. So if it's something that you're supposed to perceive consciously, you're supposed to feel it or hear it or see it, the thalamus will send it to where it's supposed to go. If it's something that the thalamus says isn't important, basically it's gonna die there and not go up to, to the cerebrum. Jesse's got a question, go for it. Uh, so Unless is you... that the same as like, if you are smelling something and then you get used to that smell because you smell it all the time so you don't even notice it anymore, but somebody else might walk in and be like, oh God, what's that smell? Is that like the same correlation? It's similar to that. Um, some of that goes a little bit more in depth than um, what we are considering because one of the things, yeah, when you go nose blind to something, right. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that makes you nose blind is uh, you get used to smelling it. And I apologize, there's a technical word for it that is escaping me at the moment. Um, but essentially, Basically, your neurons just get tired of receiving that message. So they're like, whatever, like we're done. We know it's out there and we don't care. Um, okay. So um, I think the thalamus still would send that information on, but the neurons that would receive it, they're just like, whatever. Like it still smells like, we'll, we'll say nice thing here. It still smells like yesterday's pizza, right? We'll pretend that's what it smells like and <laughs> not something much worse. <laughs> so we just go nose blind. We stop hearing it or stop perceiving it. Um, I think the thalamus would still send it there though. It's just that those neurons over here in the temporal lobe are just, they're done. They don't want to hear it anymore. Okay, that makes now sense. Now that word's gonna bug me. Um, I'm gonna look it up after class and I'll let you know what it's called. There, there is a technical word for it though, 
where our neurons get tired of responding to a message, so they just stop. They just are like, forget about this, I'm done. Like when we ignore our three-year-old after they say the same thing 50 times in a row. <laughs> exactly, yes, yeah, when we're just like, whatever. I, yeah, I know I you want you. cheese cubes. For my daughter, it's cheese cubes. I know you want cheese cubes. We already have cheese cubes. No more cheese cubes. <laughs> exactly. So thalamus, my sorter, my filterer, gets information to where it needs to go, from where it needs to go, um, all that kind of stuff there. Bring us back to those pictures. Remember, we looked at these yesterday. Just to point out, when we're doing the process of thinking, look at how many different areas of the brain were lit up, right? Meaning, look at how active our thalamus that would be here in the middle that thalamus must be going nuts, sending information to all the different places. So helping the parts of the brain to connect with each other too. Um, the, the thalamus would be more activated in sorting that information to all the right places so that, that we could do it. Brings us down, so so far we've talked about the cerebrum with all those, those lobes. We have talked about um, the cerebellum that's missing from back here. And we just talked about the thalamus in the middle and the little pineal gland. Now we're going down to the area called the brain stem. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday. When we think about the brain stem, what does the brain stem do for us in general? What's the big picture job of the brain stem? Yeah, exactly. The, when you think about the brain stem, Think about the, the most basic things that you've got to do to stay alive. That's things like breathing. That's things like keeping your heart beating. That's things like um, some of those reflexes that, that keep you safe. Um, so as you're studying uh, the brainstem and looking at the particular functions, know that the pons and the medulla are both very involved in the process of breathing. You'll talk about that more in, in AMP2, how the process of breathing works, but the pons and the medulla both contribute to that. The medulla really helps with setting your heartbeat. Um, we've got some reflex centers up here in, in the midbrain, some reflexes down here in the medulla as well. Um, big picture though, the part of your brain that really keeps you alive, those basic life functions, is the brainstem. We can stay alive without the functioning of, of our cerebrum, without the cerebrum doing its job. We can stay alive without the thalamus, for example, and, and the pineal gland and all these things in here doing their job. If these stop doing their job, we can't stay alive because this is what keeps us alive. And here's a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because there is an application activity in, in your outline about a person being in a coma if a person is in a coma and they're not on a ventilator, they can still breathe, their heart's still beating, would we say their brainstem is or is not working? If they can still breathe and their heart's beating. Yeah, exactly. When a person's in a coma, that's an issue with the cerebrum and all of those things we talked about up here, that's not an issue with the lower brain stem. So that's why someone can be alive but not be processing things because their brain stem is still intact because it's still doing those basic life processes. So brain stem keeps you alive, cerebrum makes you human, uh, the thalamus here in the middle helps the, the cerebrum do its job. I want to uh, to spend the rest of our time, got about 15 minutes, talking about blood and uh, fluid. Um, so Jacqueline, to, to your question with the critical thinking question, um, let me put that to the class. We Which parts of, of the brain did we say were still working in a patient who's in a coma? What did we say was still working? Yeah, as long as that patient can breathe and their heart is beating, their brain stem is still working. So the brain stem is, is this part right here. The, the, the pons, the medulla in particular, 
um, the, the midbrain likely is, is still working as well. So the brain stem uh, would continue to be working. Uh, so some of my other parts of the brain, it's a little difficult to know. What's the big one when a patient's in a coma? What's the big one that we said is essentially deactivated or it's broken? Yeah, the big one that definitely is not working in a patient in a coma is RAS, the reticular activating system. If the reticular activating system isn't working, then all these parts of the cerebrum would also not be working. Some of the other parts of the brain theoretically could still be working correctly. Uh, so messages might still be getting sorted to the right place in the brain. The thalamus may still be working, but if these parts of the brain are sleeping, they wouldn't receive them anyway. Someone asked about the pineal gland. Uh, the pineal gland may still be working. It's hard for us to know for sure. Um, my, my one thought about why the pineal gland may not still be working is because the pineal gland sets itself based on the visual stimuli you're receiving. So if you're in a coma and your eyes are closed all the time, your pineal gland's not going to know when to make melatonin. So I, I'm on the fence about whether or not the pineal gland will be working and, and the thalamus would be working, but 100% I'm confident that the reticular activating system is not working and the cerebrum is not working because those are the parts of the brain that make you conscious or that make you human, if you will. Does that help? Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's talk blood and let's talk cerebrospinal fluid. Who can tell me from your notes and from reading the guided lesson, each time your heart beats, we send a ton of blood up to the brain. How much blood do we send up to the brain from every heartbeat? Does anyone remember? Yeah, so 20%, that's, that's one fifth of all of the blood in your body Every time your heart beats, we're sending it toward the head. So that tells you that your brain needs a lot of blood supply. We've got blood primarily on the outside of the brain. And remember that on the inside of the brain, we have those places called ventricles, the fluid filled spaces. Um, those are, are going to be making cerebrospinal fluid that, that does some of the similar jobs to blood vessels. So we send a ton of blood up to the brain um, every heartbeat. That's because we need a constant supply of, of blood going up to the brain. Blood has two things that neurons need to survive. What are those things that neurons need to survive? Yeah, so neurons, like every other cell in your body, definitely need oxygen. That's the way that we breathe. There's a specific kind of nutrients, the one kind of nutrients that neurons eat. What's their favorite food, their only food? Yeah, it's that glucose, absolutely. So blood has oxygen, blood has glucose. I must have a constant supply of oxygen and glucose Really, I can only last six minutes without blood flow up to my brain because at that point, I have no more oxygen left and no more glucose left and my neurons will start to die. So that's why in something like a stroke, for example, it's so important to have fast intervention because if I cut off nutrients and blood supply um, for a long period of time, literally I'm going to starve my neurons to death. So lots of blood that goes up to the brain to nourish these, these neurons that live here on the outside. When we talk about the blood vessels found on the outside and the inside of the brain, these blood vessels are part of what we call the blood brain barrier. The blood brain barrier. The blood brain barrier, its job is to keep you safe 
or to keep your brain tissue safe. Way back in lesson number one, before you knew if you liked me yet, right? Or we're still deciding. <laughs> Way back in lesson number one, the easy days, yeah. We talked about the type of blood vessels that help to keep you safe. What's the name of the blood vessels that we find in the brain, that we find in the lungs, that, that keep you safe? Yeah, exactly. The type of blood vessels that we find in the brain are blood vessels called continuous capillaries. So I'm looking at a picture here. Here's the middle of my blood vessel. This yellow part right here is the membrane of those cells that's in, inside the blood vessel. Remember that with continuous capillaries, there's a continuous layer of cells that, that form a barrier between inside and outside. So the continuous capillaries form this barrier of, of cells to prevent things from going in and out. But because the brain is so important to make sure that I don't have, have stuff leaking out, I also actually wrap those cells in more connective tissue. So we've got an extra layer of cells on the outside of the blood vessels to make sure, again, that nothing can sneak in or out. So we've got continuous capillaries and we've got an extra layer of cells outside forming this thing called the blood brain barrier, basically two layers of cells. You can't, you can't get out. You have to go through these two layers of cells. Now here's where our application questions of this unit come from. Application questions being what can or cannot cross the blood brain barrier. Hey, check this out. The stuff, that can cross the blood brain barrier is the same kind of stuff that can pass straight through the membrane of a cell. Let me say it again. The stuff that can cross the blood brain barrier is the same stuff that sneaks straight inside cells. Yeah, so we're, we're putting some notes in the chat here. The kinds of things that could go straight into or out of a cell, those were the things that we called nonpolar. Those were the things that we called lipid soluble. What was uh, the name of, of how they feel about water? How do these kinds of things feel about water? Yeah, they're, they're afraid of water, right? The kinds of things that can cross the blood brain barrier are things that are nonpolar. They're things that are lipid soluble. They're things that are hydrophobic. We're basically, basically the blood brain barrier is just two layers of plasma membrane. If you can't sneak through one layer of plasma membrane and another layer of plasma membrane, you can't get through. Now, if you're nonpolar, like carbon dioxide or like oxygen, we can sneak straight through. Anything else, we're either going to have to help, we're going to have to transport, meaning I'm gonna to have to use some proteins to transport it, or it's just not gonna get out. So notice that things that are large, they're not gonna be able to leave the bloodstream. Things that have a charge, unless I specifically transport them, they're not gonna get out of the bloodstream. For, for things like amino acids, I'm gonna use a transport protein. Or for things like glucose, I've got to use a transport protein because both of these are polar. But if you're fat soluble, so if you're lipid soluble, if you're hydrophobic, if you're nonpolar, you can cross. But you're the only things that can cross. So here's my wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I promise you on the exam, I'm going to ask you whether or not, or to identify which kind of thing can get out of the blood vessels, get into the brain. You don't care what words I, I ask you about. All you care about is looking for these things. Did I tell you it's nonpolar? Did I tell you it's lipid soluble? Did I tell you it's hydrophobic? I could use some keywords to tell us it wouldn't pass th through the membrane. If I use the word polar, not going to pass through. 
If I use the word hydrophilic, not going to pass through. If I say that it's something that's really large, not going to pass through. So when you see this question on the exam, because I promise you it's going to show up, the kinds of things that can cross the blood brain barrier are the exact same kinds of things that, that got into you and out of cells. Ignore the words, just look at the descriptions. All we care about is those descriptions. Miriam asked which side of the picture shows the brain tissue. Um, actually, both sides show brain tissue. So here's a circle here. We've got some brain on, on this side and we've got some brain over here. So this is a blood vessel. Um, think about this as being one gyrus and here's another gyrus, two bumps. And then here's the sulcus in between them. A blood vessel is wedged in the middle. So two indentations where the brain is reaching up and then that blood vessel runs in between. We could have set this picture up where everything's just going to one side. Uh, it'd be the same thing. But yeah, there's technically brain tissue on both sides there. In my last little bit of time, I want to talk to you briefly about cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid, you will mostly see abbreviated as CSF. CSF, because that's way faster to type and, and way faster to say. Cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, is made by a special kind of, of blood vessels inside the brain called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus. That, by the way, is a lab word that should ring a bell. Can we remember from lab, choroid plexus did or did not leak? Are these blood vessels sealed or are they leaky? Yeah, these are, these are leaky blood vessels here, choroid plexus. Technically, what they're leaking is cerebrospinal fluid. Now, here, let's do a little bit of, of fluid applications here for us. Try to track with me. When I have fluid inside the choroid plexus, inside this blood vessel here, what do I call the fluid inside this blood vessel? What's the name of fluid outside of red blood cells, basically? Yeah, so, so when that fluid is inside the choroid plexus, it's called plasma. My blood vessels are not good at keeping plasma inside of them. When the plasma leaves the blood vessels and goes through, uh, these are called ependymal cells. They're the ones that live on the outside of the choroid plexus. When it passes through there, it goes into the ventricles, and I now call it cerebrospinal fluid. So uh, with, with the fluids in the body, it's always kind of a circle of life thing. Plasma turns into cerebrospinal fluid. It leaks out of the choroid plexus and becomes cerebrospinal fluid. Every ventricle in the brain that we talked about in lab, they all have choroid plexus. We're always making this fluid in each of these chambers of the brain. As we make this fluid, we're constantly circling it through. So here's a picture that, that kind of looks like lab. Remember that we had two really large lateral ventricles in the cerebral hemispheres. Remember that fluid left those lateral ventricles to go down into the third ventricle that was in the middle of the thalamus. From the third ventricle, then it went down into the fourth ventricle. And from the fourth ventricle, either it could go down into the middle of the spinal cord or we could dump it out here in the place that we called the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space is the, the space under the arachnoid mater all around the brain where I can dump out my cerebrospinal fluid. That was important for me because the subarachnoid space has these things called arachnoid granulations. Or in lab, we also called them an arachnoid villus or arachnoid villi. This was a place where I could dump my cerebrospinal fluid into my blood vessels to complete my circle of life. So we started in the choroid plexus where the fluid was plasma. We sent it into the ventricles where it's cerebrospinal fluid. And when I'm done with it circulating around the brain, 
I send it back into the bloodstream where it becomes plasma again. It's really important that I have these arachnoid villi or these arachnoid granulations for me to dump my cerebrospinal fluid into because I am constantly making cerebrospinal fluid all the time. My choroid plexus are always leaking plasma that turns into cerebrospinal fluid. I am always adding new fluid to this system, so I always need to be draining it. If I don't drain the fluid at the same rate that I make the fluid, I have a condition called hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. Literally what hydrocephalus means is water on the brain. That's technically what it means. But this is not a water problem. This is a problem with cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid. The problem is I'm no longer draining the fluid that I make into those arachnoid granulations and out from around my brain. It's either staying inside my ventricles or it's staying in the subarachnoid space. It's just staying somewhere. I'm not getting rid of it. In a, an infant, in a very young child like we see here, um, there is a structure that allows the skull to expand for this to not, not, be, not be fatal. What did the, the fetal skull and the child skull have that allowed it to change shape? Yeah, exactly. Fontanelles. So fontanelles allow for skull expansion. Does the adult skull have fontanelles? Do our skulls have fontanelles? Yeah, we, we don't have fontanelles anymore. We have things called sutures. Yep. And when we talk about sutures, is there movement at a suture? Do we see any movement? Yeah, zero movement, right? So no bone movement, which the corollary to that is no bone expansion. No bone expansion. Hydrocephalus is always a serious medical condition. We are always going to treat it. Um, we'll use a thing called a shunt, which is literally a tube that will go from um, the cranial space, a lot of times down into the abdominal area and just drain the fluid down there. We will always treat hydrocephalus. In adults, uh, in, in children who have sutures though, Hydrocephalus is very, um, is very deadly because there's no space for that extra fluid to go. What ends up happening is that fluid puts pressure on the brain, or more importantly, it ends up putting pressure on the brain stem, and a person um, is killed because of the high pressure that's put on, on their brain. So hydrocephalus is when I have too much cerebrospinal fluid serious um, but maybe more treatable in in a young child because they have fontanelles to to give us a little more wiggle room in adults very very serious uh, often fatal because we have nowhere to send that fluid there was a question in the chat about where we're, we're draining the fluid when it goes out those arachnoid granulations um, whoever answered was correct it, it does go into the bloodstream so when we, we drain it, it goes into those blood vessels and then it goes back into circulation. So the big idea being it gets out of the space around the brain. Yeah, so Jacqueline, we can have too much fluid. Typically, it's going to be too much fluid inside the ventricles themselves. Yes. Um, or if we're having an issue, let me go back here. Um, if we're having an issue with our granulations being closed, it's possible, too, that we would have too much fluid in the subarachnoid space but most likely it's probably an issue with too much fluid inside these ventricles. One of my, my ventricular tubes may be blocked, for example, um, preventing me from draining fluid out of it. Um, yeah, so Vanessa asked about the location of the shunt. Yeah, we, so if somebody has hydrocephalus, um, they would, would do imaging to figure out exactly where our, our flow is blocked. 
Um, so for example, if the interventricular foramen is what's giving us trouble, so we can't drain from the lateral ventricles into the third, we would have to put a shunt in one of those lateral ventricles. Or if it was an issue with the cerebral aqueduct, we would have to put our shunt in the third ventricle. Um, so they would evaluate where the blockage is and use that to figure out where to put the shunt. Absolutely. I hate to end on such a sobering note, right, with, with hydrocephalus, but it's a great correlation to make to the way that, that the brain works and the way that that the system circulates that fluid. Yeah, so um, I, I see a note in the chat here as we're, we're wrapping this up. Um, reminder that yes, we're gonna do a review session on Monday of next week, Monday at 9.30, we'll do a review for the exam. Um, I can definitely talk about the sensory and motor homunculus for sure, yep. Are there any other particular topics that you all are thinking of at the moment to help me prepare for, for Monday's review session? As you're typing to remember, um, we have the homework assignment for lecture and lots of assignments actually for lecture on, on Sunday night as we wrap up unit number three. Um, Okay, cool, it's awesome about the cross bridge cycle for sure. Yep, so I'm gonna make a note for myself here. We wanna do cross bridge. We wanna do the homunculi. Yep, I can definitely cover those things. So don't forget about those assignments. Don't forget about um, your group wiki, current events, um, lab stuff. It, it's a big, big working weekend. So try to get some stuff done tomorrow. Um, to get it out of the way, we, we have visible body, but if you can also knock out some other lab or lecture stuff, you'll be in good shape. That'll, that'll help you out get prepared for, for next week. So um, if there's no other questions for me today, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. I'll stick around in the chat for any last minute questions. Otherwise, I hope to see most of you Monday morning for our review.